Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to Numbers chapter 22, um, and I'm guessing there's probably some confused faces because I think everybody thought I would be in Revelations. Uh, we're going to start there, but we're just going to be there briefly before we jump back to Numbers, and this is all to set up the series or the main theme of what we're going to be looking at over the next few weeks, uh, which is spiritual warfare. And we're going to be looking at the seven churches in Revelations and how they face spiritual warfare and how we're going to see it and how we can stand against it. Um, does anybody like to study history? Okay, quite a few people. That's good. Have you guys heard of a gentleman named George Santayana? He wrote a book in 1905 titled The Life of Reason. And there's a famous quote in that book that we still use today. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That's another reason why I feel the Lord wanted us to look at these seven churches in Revelations. We're looking at now in Acts how the churches got started and how they got through the hurdles and all of that. But I think he wanted us to also look at what can happen down the road if we lose sight of God, if we lose our way, if you will. So... As I was looking through all of these different churches, I got to noticing something. There was a, a group of people mentioned a couple times, the Nicolaitans. And the more I read it, like, who is this group? Because you don't see that name anywhere except in Revelations. So it's, hmm. I thought, well, I'm sure the Lord gave me this question so that I would dig deeper. So I got to researching and looking, and let's just say Google was not very helpful. Um, it was kind of all over the place. There were a few different articles that I found. None of them really supported each other. So I was like, I don't really feel comfortable talking about that up here. So I was Okay, what does God's word say about them? Because where they're mentioned in Revelation is in Revelations 2, verse 6, in the church at Ephesus. It says, Yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So it was part of their commendation. It was something that they were doing that Jesus found to be good. They didn't follow the Nicolaitans. The other instance we see is in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, when he's addressing Pergamum. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. So, huh, okay. I've heard Balaam before. It's like, okay, let's do some more digging. So I got to got to looking, and in Second Peter chapter two verse fifteen it says, "Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam." the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. So there's Balaam again. He doesn't specifically say it was the Nicolaitans, but it was a group of people following the same teachings that Balaam had. In Jude one eleven, it says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. Again, Balaam's name pops up again. So, hmm, okay. And if you 
if you read all of chapter 2 in 2 Peter, it's, he's talking about false teachers in that chapter. And in Jude, it's all about contending for the faith and false teachers. So, where did it all start? And now this is where we go to Numbers chapter 22. So Balaam's story starts in Numbers 22, and it goes through Numbers 24. I'm not going to read the whole story, uh, since it's several chapters all at once. Um, But just from the scriptures that I found in the New Testament, I knew, okay, this, this is a bad guy, right? So I got to reading through and made it up through the talking donkey. And am I the only one that hears Eddie Murphy's voice when I read the talking donkey part? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just, maybe I watch Shrek too many times. But uh, so I make it up through that. And then I start into the rest of the story, like into the prophecies that Balaam actually made. And I'm puzzled. I'm like, I'm not seeing where he prophesied against Israel. Hmm. So I read it again. Still didn't see it. And a third time. And a fourth time. Every time I read it, Numbers 22, verse 7, would jump out and said, So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. So that verse plainly tells us Balaam is a prophet for hire. He wanted money for his prophecies. And he would prophesy whatever you wanted for the right number of zeros on the check, if you will. So, it's like, okay, I know God's word doesn't contradict itself, so it's something that I'm missing. So I read it again and again, and I prayed, and Lord, I'm not seeing it. Because at the end of chapter 24, it says that Balaam and Balak parted ways. It's like, okay, so I'll again, read through it again, and the Holy Spirit helped me see it. This time, in Numbers twenty two eighteen, and there's another section where he says just about the same thing. It said, but Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. Okay. In chapter 24, verses 12 and 13, Balaam and Balak are coming off the Mount of Peor. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messengers whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own will. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. So still... He's saying, I wouldn't go beyond what the Lord tells me to say for a house full of silver and gold. Kind of similar to what we would say today, man, I wouldn't do that for a million dollars. But it's the way we say it. It's the emphasis we put on certain words. It's our body language when we say it. These are things that are hard to capture when it's just text. So, if he were to say, did I not tell you that, you know, I couldn't do it for this much? That would kind of open Balak's mind to go, okay, well, what about this much? What about two houses full of gold and silver? Kind of makes you wonder how many zeros he had to put on the check to get Balaam to go against the Lord, especially after his encounter with Jesus on the road there. 
saying, I almost killed you. And maybe we can all get a, a donkey like his that'll save us from God's wrath. That would just be awesome. <laughs> but so we know something happened because when we get to chapter 25, it's just utter chaos, straight downhill slide. So it says, while in Israel, or excuse me, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Now, remember, Balak is a Moabite. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their God, and the people ate and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor. And looking in chapter 24, that was the last mountain that Balaam and Balak descended from. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. And Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. That's quite a large number. So it went downhill fast. All from one man. And if you read on through Numbers and you get to Numbers 31, verse 16, it said, Behold, these, on Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And so the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. So it wasn't recorded the price it took for Balaam to go against the Lord. But all the scriptures line up that way. So, he was a prophet for the prophets. There was a spirit behind him working, a spirit of greed. Because that's all he was after was money. And Jesus doesn't have anything good to say about a hireling. If you look at John 10, verses 12 and 13... It says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And we can see that in play right here because Balaam wasn't an Israelite. He cared nothing for the Israelite people. He only cared about money. And that was the driving spirit behind him with everything that he did. So, back to the Nicolaitans. That was a group of people who, it says, followed the teachings of Balaam. So, they were all about money. You see what, what Balaam and Balak did in chapter 25 of Numbers to the people of Israel. So, you can put sexual immorality, all kinds of stuff in there that you take from that. The group itself, as far as I know, there's no Church of the Nicolaitans out there right now. Um, but you can bet the spirit behind that group is still alive. You see that spirit working through Balaam and Balak. Once you get to the New Testament... You see it in Second Peter. You see it in Jude. Jesus talks about it in Revelations. 
So, there's one point I wanted to make with all this. And I know might be some folks saying, well, well, no, it's a three-point sermon, or it's this kind of sermon. It's like, no, there's one point, and it's very, very important when it comes to spiritual warfare. It happened back then. It's been happening since Satan got cast out of heaven all the way up till now, and it's going to continue until Jesus comes back. But the main point is this Bible could be used as a mirror. And you think, okay, mirror lets me see my reflection. It helps me to see what's wrong with myself. It helps me to see all this. But there's two other things that a mirror is very good at. The first thing it lets you see what's behind you. You notice as we were going through this, it was the spirit behind Balaam. It was the spirit behind the church. It was the spirit behind these people in Second Peter. So when I hold this up, I can see myself, but I move just a little bit and I can see what's behind me. I can see what spirit's behind me, controlling me, moving me around. Telling me, go this way, go that way, stop right here, don't go, don't do that, do this. And if we listen to that spirit long enough, we start to make excuses for that spirit. Like, oh, well, it's just my personality. You know, I, you know, it would, it could even go into like the, stereotypes that we give different ethnical groups like oh well you know I drank a lot because I'm Irish that's just what Irish people do or I have a bad temper because I'm Italian pick your ethnic group there's a stereotype we can make excuses like that all day long but in the end it's some spirit other than the Holy Spirit behind us because if you have the Holy Spirit and you're following the Holy Spirit, you're not going to have a bad attitude. You're not going to have a lot of anger. You're not going to drink a lot. You're not going to do anything outside of what the Holy Spirit leads you to. And if you're not sure what's behind you, if you examine yourself examined behind you and you're, you're just not sure like I, I'm not seeing anything look at the atmosphere that you leave is it an atmosphere of love peace, joy or is it chaos anger when you walk into a room do people go oh man he's here Shh, don't talk about it I hope it goes away or do they say, hey, brother, I'm glad you're here. This is going to be an awesome day. And as we go through these churches, we'll see different spirits. One of, I guess you will, I guess you could say the more famous ones, the ones that are more talked about, are the Ahab and Jezebel spirit. And you can read their story in 1 Kings. But Jezebel, whew, she was a handful. She was very much controlling. She was very much what we would call a type A personality, an alpha. I got to be in charge. I got to lead. Just it's my way or the highway. Very micromanaging. Always wants to be leadership. And we see people like that. And we're like, oh, yeah. You know, that goes back to, well, that's just my personality. I took a test. I'm a EMJT or something. And it's like, okay, cool. I talked to the Holy Spirit. And he said the test he gave you, you turned out to be a J-E-R-K. So, 
But we see these spirits. And we got we have to fight against them. We have to stand against them. And now I told you there were two things that a mirror is good for. Because I, I, I know everybody's thinking like, well, this got dark quick. But I'm about to land this plane. So second thing that this is good for, as a mirror, what else is a mirror good for? Does, does anybody do any kind of hiking? Spend a lot of time out in the woods? So maybe in your pack you have a little signal mirror just in case you get lost aircraft flying around you can signal right so how do you use one of those so get a good view of the sun you can see the aircraft and they say you know you either hold some fingers up something like this so that when you shine the light you can see it hit your hand and you know it's going towards the aircraft and you just kind of go back and forth like that. So when we're lost, when some spirit has gotten us off the path, mirror, again, think mirror. When you hold this up, instead of putting a thumb out, reach your hand to the Lord. And say, Lord, I'm lost. I need your help to get back on the path. That's the best rescue team that you'll ever come across is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because they will reach out every single time and help you get back on the path that they want you to be on. But the question, questions I want to leave you guys with to think on, to pray on. What spirits have you allowed to creep into your life and to start controlling you? Like I said, just as easily as I read past that in numbers several times, we can just as easily overlook our own sin. So where have you overlooked your own sin? The Holy Spirit will show you. The Bible will show you. And most importantly, are you bringing those spirits into your home, to your family? Are you bringing them into the church? Heavenly Father, we come to you again this evening and we want to thank you, Lord, for being here with us. We thank you, Lord, for just helping us to unpack this message. And we thank you for showing us all the things that you wanted us to see. And we just ask, Lord, that as we go through our week, that you burden us to ask you what's behind us. That you burden us to reach out to you for help, to get rid of any evil spirits that are on us, that are controlling us in a manner that you don't find acceptable. And we ask, Lord, that as we go through this week and even next week and the following months, that you help us to remember that anything that's behind us is not of you because the Holy Spirit is always in front of us, leading us and guiding us and never behind us. And Lord, we just ask that you be with every one of us as we leave here and just watch over all of us through the week and just help us to, to live our life in a manner that pleases you, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.